Yay, we were up to 57 people who have uh, joined us this evening. Wonderful. Okay, it is almost time to start, everyone. Uh, I am Lois Engel, and I am the president of the Williamson County Master Gardeners Association. And I want to, um, let me go to a screen share where I can screen, I can share a particular slide with you. Just a moment. Couple of things I want to announce tonight before we start. One is, um, let me do the screen share again, see if I can do this. Um, there is a slide about the um, meeting next month, which is our first in-person meeting this year, yay, which is wonderful. So we look forward to seeing all of you there, actually seeing you in person and not just on Zoom. And Phyllis Kim and Mandy Richardson will be presenting for us next month. So we really are looking forward to that. The second thing I want to um, mention is a tip of the hat, so to speak, uh, to one of our master gardeners, Sonia, Sonia Schutze. And she is kind of a behind the scenes person in more ways than one. Over the years, she's been a great communicator through her wonderful photographs. She's an awesome photographer. She makes things pop. And now in, in recent um, times, she has been one of our um, leaders in the vegetable garden. She, along with her uh, partner in crime, uh, Judy Ebaugh, have looked at the um, um, backyard garden and imagined the possibilities and have done great things with that. So go out and visit that. And when you see her, um, tell her, yay, thank you for all that you do to make the demo gardens a, a wonderful place to be. A shout out about our upcoming Hands on the Garden. It is the fourth Saturday in August. Um, now, this time, it will not be in the garden. It will be at the uh, Wilco Way um, building because of the intense heat. And um, a, a little reminder about a couple of volunteer opportunities. Um, one of them will be coming up in October with the Williamson County Fair and Rodeo. And if you want to volunteer to be part of the um, extension office tent. We will have a booth there. Let me know. I will have a sign up online as well. But for now, just put that on your radar and that will be wonderful. And then I thought this might give you a smile. Um, it gave me a new, as a, as a college admissions person in my former life, this really gave me a smile and a new perspective on uh, student loans. And so I thought that was pretty cool. And so now let me find my way back to uh, the, let's see, find my way back to our um, Zoom meeting. And I want to um, introduce you to a gentleman who's going to be our presenter this evening. His name is John Swan, and he's with the Wicked Bee Aviary. What an awesome name that is. Wonderful, John. That is so amazing. And he uh, specializes in rescuing honeybees in a very natural way. Is that correct, John? So that they can be their genetic best self. And um, that is a wonderful thing to do. He's going to tell you about gardening with bees. And I do want to tell you that he will answer questions at the end of tonight's program. So be sure sure and open up your chat box and put your questions in there and then we'll address those at the end of the evening. You will all be muted during this presentation except for John and so John we're ready to rock and roll and have you talk to us about bees and um, gardening so take it away John. Very good thank you um, can you hear me okay? I can can everybody awesome. else a nod of the head? You can hear yes. you. Hey, Head's okay. nodding. Very good. So, yes, um, I do specialize in honeybees primarily, and I am a certified master beekeeper, much like you are certified master gardeners. So, very similar things. We, we have to work in concert with one another, um, both for 
my favorite little critters to survive and for all of your favorite plants to survive. So it's kind of a good marriage of the two things. And we're gonna go through today, we're gonna to discuss planting for pollinators actually as a whole. Um, there are some specifics in there for bees, but I've tried to make this more generalized so that we're not just talking about the honeybee. And we'll, uh, we'll kind of focus a little bit on some more woody shrub type things to begin with, because I want to tell everybody how they can kind of get the most bang for their buck if you are limited on space or limited on funds, but you still want to be able to do something to help all pollinators in general. So we're going to go through and uh, I'm going to attempt to bounce back and forth here between screens and hopefully do this smoothly. And uh, I will I will come back to the main screen to share pertinent information when the time is appropriate. But for now, if, uh, if this works correctly, everybody should now see a black background with planting for pollinators. Wonderful, awesome. yes. Very good. Mm -hmm. Okay, so again, as I stated, you know, I am specializing in bees. I, I am a master beekeeper and I do as much as I possibly can with honeybees at any point in time. But the little bee, the honeybee is not native to the United States. It's actually not native to a lot of the places that it is. Man carried the honeybee with them from continent to continent because they wanted the honey and they needed the wax. And it was really primarily about that. It didn't start off necessarily to be about pollination so much in the beginning as it was a source of food. And then later a source of the very first alcohol, which was mead. They would use the honey to actually make mead before we even had grain alcohols and things like that. And then the other part of that was light and being able to have illumination in a lot of the places and, and having that beeswax for multiple different purposes other than just candles. They could use it to make soaps, bombs, salves, all kinds of things. So the honeybee definitely does get the spotlight, but the honeybee is not the only thing out there. So all of these beautiful insects here, these are all bees and not a single one of them is a honeybee. And that is an amazing thing. So in the United States, there are 4,000 different species of bees and the majority of those are solitary bees. And in the state of Texas, we have a thousand of those plus or minus a little bit. So we literally have a quarter of all of the native bees that are in the United States live here in Texas. And it is a very wide diverse group of insects. Most of them again being solitary uh, a good portion of them are eusocial. They'll go through and they're not cyclical like the honeybee where they stay everlasting, but they will form small groups and colonies and have sort of social lives here and there. Um, bumblebees being one of those, bumblebees will actually nest in the ground and the queen will actually do most of the work initially. And then as she raises workers, she will then move over to just producing more bees and the workers will take over the work. But at the end of that year, that colony goes away. So it's not exactly the same scenario, but they're all out there working for us and for our benefit and for the plants. So in addition to the bees, we have these beautiful critters that we all love to see out there on our flowers. You've got butterflies, which take up the day shift going and pollinating. And then you also have moths, which can be just as pretty in the right light and they take up the night shift and they go and they pollinate plants at the night. In addition to the butterflies and the bees and the moths, you have ants, you've got uh, wasps. Actually, I mis misquoted that a minute ago. Um, you have wasps in addition to bees and wasps, we see them more as predatory, but they also do go out and they do pollination, although it's kind of accidental. They're looking for the nectar more so than the pollen a lot of times, but they will help pollinate. And there's beetles, there's all kinds of insects that go out there and help in this pollination service. In addition to the insects, you have birds. And hummingbirds are a great example of a beautiful little pollinator that is also out there working in tandem with all of the other insects to go through and help pollinate the plants. Now, just like the butterflies do the day shift and the moths do the night shift, well, the birds have a night shift as well, and those are the bats. And we really don't like to think about the bats. Really, when we, we see the bat, we think more, eek, you know, it's a bat. Um, but the bats actually are very crucial. One, they eat a lot of the insects we don't like. 
but two, they also pollinate a lot of plants. And there's a lot of different plants out there that specifically bloom at night for the moths and for the bats to go through and partake in that. So that's kind of, now that we've, we've gone through all these beautiful little pictures here, that's kind of the introduction of who are the pollinators? Who are the different critters out there that we are trying to help and trying to sustain? Now let's take a look real quick at what their natural environment in the perfect world should actually look like. Now, each of these photos that are gonna come up are going to have something in common. And we will address that in just a moment, but pay attention to each of them as they come across the screen. They all share something in common other than just the fact that they're beautiful landscapes. They're covered in flowers. And not only are they covered in flowers, but if you notice the colors repeat quite a lot. Now, the point of that is that yes, there is a plethora of different things out there, but there's an abundance of each of those individual things. And that is very, very important because some of your pollinators do not go from flower A to flower D to flower Z, they just stick with flower A. And they're very focused on some of those things. So if you have a small space, you can't really recreate this beautiful landscape that you see in these photos where you've got the room to have thousands of different plants and thousands of each of those plants. And that's really what that wild landscape looks like. And that's what we're trying to go through and mimic whenever we do things for pollinators. Now, unfortunately, fortunately or unfortunately, however you would uh, like to necessarily view that, um, let me, I used to be really good at this. There we go. Stop share. And now I come back. Okay. So, so you don't have to just stare at a still image here for a while. Um, one of the things that we do when we go out and we plant our gardens, we do want to see that biodiversity and we want to have all of these beautiful different colors out there. But in the instance of, for instance, the honeybee, when you have one type of every plant, you may have 50 plants and it may be a beautiful landscape, but the bee is only looking for a specific type on a specific day. And if you do that, you're not necessarily going to be attracting the amount of pollinators that you could if you maximized on a single plant. So I want to bring that up because it is very important. You can help all pollinators or you can make a decision to go through and just help a specific group of pollinators. And there's nothing wrong with doing that. If you choose to just help, for instance, this beautiful creature that we all should know very well, the monarch butterfly. There's nothing wrong with saying, I just want to help monarchs. Because when you're doing that, you're not just helping monarchs, you're going to help several other species of butterflies, as well as certain species of moths, as well as a lot of those native bees that we talked about being here in the state. So you can focus on one thing and still be helping multiple different species of pollinators survive. But when you focus on that one thing, you can then also maximize the benefit to that individual species. So in the instance of uh, monarch butterfly, there is a bush out there called a butterfly bush. And it's aptly named because it is very prolific with flowers and it does attract a lot of butterflies. However, the downside to the butterfly bush is it's just providing a food source. It's not necessarily providing any type of natural habitat for the butterfly. So if you were gonna focus on monarchs, instead of planting something like a butterfly bush that would just feed them, you can plant milkweeds, which will feed them and provide a host organism or a host plant for them to complete their life cycle, lay another generation of eggs, have something for those caterpillars to go out there and actually eat. Now, that sounds simple in the grand scheme of things. Unfortunately, most, things in, uh, in our world are a contradiction. And uh, I like to tell people all the time when it comes to beekeeping things, beekeeping is the art of contradiction because you will find so many things that go exactly against what you just heard. And this is a great example of that because there are lots of different types of milkweed, lots of them. If you go and you buy a milkweed that is not necessarily indigenous to our region, it may provide a food source, much like that butterfly bush did, but it may not provide the natural habitat that that specific butterfly would have partaked in. So do some research whenever you're going out there and 
picking what type of pollinator you want to support. Make sure that you are maximizing the benefit by planting a big majority of that specific plant, especially if it's a plant that just makes individual flowers. Um, one of the things where it comes back to bang for your buck is if you plant a seed and that seed makes one stem and that stem makes one flower, that's not very enticing and it doesn't provide as much benefit than if you planted a hundred of those seeds and they made a hundred stems that made a hundred flowers. Now, again, we don't all necessarily have the space to be able to go out and do this. So how can you maximize your space and your effort if you have a small backyard garden and you want to be able to help the pollinators? That's where we're going to start off with some of these woody shrubs and, and small bushes and trees to begin with. And you'll see a little pattern here as we go through that hopefully will start kind of becoming apparent. So the very first one is one of my favorites. I'm a little biased. I put it at the top because I grew up where we had lilacs. True lilacs, not the thing you're gonna see in the next slide, but true lilacs, and they smelled amazing. The closest thing that we have here that I can like to that is gonna be the mountain laurel. And mountain laurel has a very beautiful smell. It's almost like a grape candy, but it's very fragrant. Laurel, awesome. Almond verbena, since how I can't grow lilacs in Texas because that just doesn't work. Almond verbena is very similar to that. It is super fragrant. But notice on each of those little stems, you have a plume of flowers. So you might look at it from a distance and say, oh, it's a bush with some flowers. But each one of those stems, every little white dot is an individual flower. And that individual flower produces its own nectar and its own pollen. So if you are a pollinator who is going to be single-minded and focused, you're also needing to be very efficient you spend a lot of energy flying around trying to find things. So if you can find an abundant source of one thing, you can make multiple stops with one flight and then return back to your nest cavity or return back to your colony. So in this instance, every one of those little stems, that insect or that butterfly or that bird can literally go from flower to flower to flower all the way up that stem, visit hundreds of individual blooms on one bush before it ever has to return back to its colony. And that is an amazing thing. That's where you can get that bang for your buck is being able to plant something that is going to have prolific blooms, but still provide you with what you want, which is to help the pollinators provide a food source for them. So here we go, the second slide. Vitex, which is, I will say, inappropriately called Texas Lilac. Because again, if you've ever seen a real lilac, this is not it. <laughs> it does not smell. It, it has a little bit of a smell, but it's not, to me, it's not a pretty smell. Um, but it is a pretty lilac color, so I will let them keep the name just for that purpose. That's, that's the only reason. But the Texas lilac, the Vitex, again, it is a small wooded bush slash, if you don't prune it and keep it under control, can become a tree. And it produces prolific blooms. And we see again that same repeating pattern that I just mentioned prior. Lots of tiny little flowers on each of those individual little stems makes it very beneficial for your native pollinators to come to this. Now, this specific type of plant does not really ever attract honeybees, but it does attract several species of native bee that is solitary bees and solitary nesters. One of those being the Texas longhorn bee and another one being the mason bee. So they will come to this type of tree and they will get the pollen and the nectar from that. And you're still benefiting these other types of pollinators. The butterflies, I don't know that I've ever seen like a flock of butterflies around them. Um, so I can't necessarily attribute the butterfly aspect to this specific plant. Texas bee brush, also known as white bush. Now this one's in here because it is deciduous. It is native to our area. It grows wild out there on its own and it fits the profile of many, many, many blooms per individual branch. Now, the downside to this is if it is not kept, it gets very scraggly and it can become not necessarily as pretty if you were gonna have it in your front yard as a you know lawn feature. So this is one that will take a little bit more care. There's another one in here that is very closely related to this as well. And uh, we will come to that in just a moment. But again, something that will actually survive in our area that can go through droughts, but every time it does get the rain, prolific blooms will form on that plant that then goes through and, and is able to actually help our pollinators. 
Now, I always say this one wrong, but we're going to go with Enakua. <laughs> That's what I'm sticking with for today. So this one here is a small tree slash shrub, but it does have one main actual trunk to it. So it is more closely related to the tree than it is to a bush. And this one does the same thing. It's going to produce tons of tiny little flowers. Now, the little flowers on this are very similar to the flowers on holly. And holly is another great thing. It's not in the presentation, but holly is something that blooms very early in the year and provides an, a wonderful uh, native source of both pollen and nectar for the native pollinators that are out there. So having holly is actually a great thing. There's many different varieties of holly, but they all provide that food source. And they provide it at a crucial time of year, coming out of winter into the early spring, when there's not a lot of other things out there that are blooming. So again, this one here could be something that you could put in your front yard instead of having you know, nothing against the live oak because you know they are protected and we love them dearly, but they're everywhere. So instead of planting another oak tree, you could plant something like this that's actually going to bloom and provide the native pollinators a place that they can come and they can get the food that they so desperately need, especially in times, well, not this year, <laughs> but especially in times where it's super hot and there's no food available. So Normally, we're in August, and has anybody noticed that there's still flowers out there because it keeps raining, and the, uh, like, honeybees, for instance, they're still bringing in pollen, and they're still bringing in nectar. That usually stops in the middle of July at the latest, so for it to still be that way into August is amazing, but it's, it doesn't really quite make up for the very rough start we had at the beginning of the year when everything froze and died, and a lot of our early blooms never happened, and a lot of our trees that we relied on didn't do anything this year because they were too busy trying to rebuild and repair from the shock that they went through. So right now, things are very topsy-turvy, but a lot of the things in this presentation are geared towards those time periods when not a lot of other things are blooming, and it's, it's very crucial to have those items in there to kind of fill the gaps to help the pollinators out through some of the harder times of the year. Carolina buckthorn is another tree, and it's a smaller tree, can get 12 to 15 foot in height, and it is also deciduous, and it also, very much like the Anakua, has the nice little clusters of individual flowers. So every one of these little stems is going to have a whole plethora of flowers that, again, all your pollinators can come and partake in. Now, one of the upsides to the Carolina buckthorn is that it does provide edible berries for a lot of the native songbirds that are in the area. So you get a twofer for that one. You're helping the pollinators, but you're also providing habitat and another food source for a completely different species. Kidney wood. This is another one that I was saying, this is the one that I was comparing back to the bee brush, the white bush. It's very similar. It is also native out here. It can just kind of grow out on its own. It can get kind of spindly, so you kind of have to keep it shaped if you want it to be presentable. Although if you do have a good chunk of land and you want to provide some sort of smaller barrier, the white brush and the kidney wood both will do that. Um, it doesn't get super, super tall, but it can get kind of lanky. Um, it can go up to 10 foot though. So again, keeping it kind of trimmed and shaped is usually a little bit better. And as with everything else that we've talked about so far, tons of tiny little flowers. Those tiny little flowers are very important. If you haven't figured it out, because I've said it multiple times already, that is the common denominator that we're trying to get to. Multiple stops in one little place where you can go get the biggest bang for your buck, both for yourself and for the pollinators to come out and visit those plants. Now, a beautiful small little bush that does well out here is the desert willow. And the desert willow is much like the others where when it does rain, it'll bloom. Give it a few days afterwards, it'll start making blooms. Those blooms are pretty. They add a nice aesthetic to your yard or to your landscape, but they provide an amazing nectar source and a pollen source for a lot of these native pollinators out there. So again, I know that, you know, we're all, we're, we're talking to master gardeners here and, and we're used to thinking vegetables and we're used to thinking our flower gardens and our flower beds, not necessarily this tree or this bush or this shrub. And that's one of the reasons why I wanted to put this in here is because again, it's overlooked a lot and it is gonna provide a lot more sustainable food sources for the pollinators than that individual flower. Now we will get to some flowers here very, very quickly though. So quickly, in fact, I think I'm going way faster than I normally do. 
<laughs> All right, Buttonbush. Buttonbush is something that kind of reminds me of a Dr. Zeus novel. Um, that and horse mint, the actual wild native flower that grows out here, looks like something that crawled out of a Dr. Seuss novel, right? Um, in this case, you've got this nice little perfectly round ball with all these little spikes that come off of it. And if you look closely, every single one of those is an individual flower. So you've got what looks like a flower that is composed of tons of tiny little flowers. So again, perfect little one-stop shop. This is a smaller plant. It's a very woody kind of shrub, but it's only six to eight foot. So not as tall as some of the ones that we talked about earlier, which are more small trees than a bush or a shrub. And it loves the full sun and the bees absolutely love it. This usually comes into bloom a little bit later in the like late spring, early summer is when that one's usually gonna start blooming, which is a nice kind of little stop gap along the way for most of the insects out there. Now, flowers. Okay, so I'm gonna stop talking to you about woody shrubs. We're gonna move over into flowers. Salvias, all of them, love them, doesn't matter. I have blue salvia on here because again, partial to honeybees and honeybees love the color blue, but all the salvias, the whole family is an amazing plant, especially if you're also trying to tr attract some of those other pollinators like the hummingbirds or the wild native bumblebees love these types of plants. And then there's also little tricks that some of these insects learn that just crack me up. For instance, a bumblebee, pretty hefty little critter, will land on one of the ends of these and you actually see the whole plant bend down. And then when the bee flies off, it springs back up. But a lot of times they don't have necessarily a long enough tongue to get down the shoot of some of these long tubular flowers like your hummingbird would or like a butterfly would. But certain bees have learned workarounds to that where they'll go to the base of the flower and they'll still be able to get to the nectar by kind of sticking their tongue between the petals down at the very base instead of trying to come at the tip and they can actually make it work. So salvias are great. Now also, what do we notice here? Technically, I mean, that's multiple plants in there but it's kind of one clumping of plants and it's prolific in its blooms. It makes tons of those blooms. And that is the most important part here. Bang for the buck, the more blooms you can get out of a single plant, the better. Desert globe mallow. Now this is one of them that does well. It's root hardy. And if it does get the moisture, it will bloom prolifically. So this is something that I've thrown in there just to give a little bit of nuance and kind of some interesting color and something a little bit different than everything else. Uh, it's not a cluster of little white flowers like 50% of everything you saw before. So you add a little bit of splash of color in here. And our next one is Rock Rose, which is very similar in the fact that it is going to kind of blanket and spread. So you've got different plants in there, but they all do make a prolific amount of blooms if they are tended to properly and they get the right conditions that they need. Now this one again, can bloom all the way from spring through the fall. So it's a great stop gap because if it's in your yard and you're tending to it and you're watering it, it's going to continuously keep producing and continuously keep blooming. And because of that, you're then going to be able to have food available for these pollinators in times like August when normally we're in a dearth and there is no nectar or pollen available. So that is a great one to have on there and it can kind of act as a ground cover in certain areas depending on how you have things set up and you're planting something that you could plant taller things to come above it and have your different varieties in there while still having something low lying that is very prolific. Coneflower, AKA Echinacea. Now this is a wonderful little thing here. The coneflower and all of its cousins all the way up through your sunflowers. These are a little bit deceptive from what we looked at on the other ones. That is an individual flower and it has an individual row of petals around the outside of it. However, the cone in the center, every single one of those little cones is a repository of nectar and pollen. So just like the other plants where you had this prolific amount of blooms, the cone flower actually acts the same way. And if you watch any of the pollinators land on the cone flower, they move around. They stay on that flower, but they're constantly dipping their tongue into different sections and moving around because that is multiple little blooms inside the cone. 
So those are actually very great to have. And for the most part, from what I've noticed here, they're very hardy. <laughs> Once you get them to grow, you almost can't not get them to grow. They're just gonna stay there and they're gonna keep blooming, which can be a benefit for certain. It also will bloom spring through fall. Um, so that is also very beneficial. And it's one that can actually do a little bit of the, the part sun, part shade, depending on how you have it set up and what your yard is as well. I know for myself, my front yard is the only thing that gets any sunlight. My backyard is completely in shade and it makes planting a nightmare because I have the most space in the backyard and the fewest things can go back there. <laughs> so that's always a challenge as well, but that is not addressed in this presentation. Um, sunflowers, again, related to your cone flower, you have that outer ring of petals, but the cone in the center of the sunflower, every single one of those little places is a repository for pollen and for nectar. And the bees and the insects and the birds are gonna come out there and they're gonna partake in that. Now this flower will attract two different species of native bees, which are very, very interesting. The longhorn bee, which you heard me mention earlier, and it's called that because its antennae actually come out really far and then curve up at the end like a longhorn cow. The other one is the green eyed bee or the quote unquote sunflower bee. And if you get close to it, they look like supersized honeybees, but their eyes are a bright green and then they have a distinctive kind of slit in the center of it. So it's almost like looking at a cat eye. It's a real crazy looking bee, but they love these flowers. They're individual solitary bees and they will ground nest. And a lot of times people will see them and think, oh my God, I've got an infestation of bees and they think they're honeybees or something else, but they're not. They're, they're digging their little burrows. They'll have mating sessions where you'll see several of them flying around, but for the most part, they just stick to their own and they go out there and they pollinate the flowers. Sunflowers are amazing, especially the native varieties because they are very well adapted and they bloom, like all the ones that I have right at the moment are still in full bloom. We're in August again, and they will bloom all the way through August, which provides that wonderful nectar source, that beautiful stopgap in those months that normally all of our other plants have already tuckered out. They've quit blooming. They've done their cycle because most of what we plant is honestly geared towards either the spring or the fall. They don't necessarily fit that middle area of July and August because uh, one of my favorite things I saw at one point, I'll switch this over real quick. So... For us, for beekeepers, we actually have calendars of nectar flows and the different types of plants that actually produce the most nectar for a honeybee at different times of the year. And my favorite thing ever is when it gets to August, it actually says nothing. Nothing grows, everything dies, and the asphalt melts. <laughs> That's the designation for August in Central Texas on the nectar flow calendar for beekeepers. And so I love that. So anything that you can put out there that is actually going to go through and provide a floral nectar source for all of these different pollinators in that hottest part of the year is very, very, very crucial to the survival of all of them, not just the honeybee, but all of them. So, okay, anyhow, now that I'm off of my little August rant there, we'll go back over to our presentation here. And next up after the sunflower is the fragrant mist flower. Now, this is a very prolific plant because as the stems lay down, they will root and they will continue spreading. And that's great if you want a giant mat of this plant. And again, we started off at the very beginning of this saying, bang for your buck, the more of one thing you can have, the more of that specific species you're going to attract. Anything that is keyed into that type of floral source or food source is gonna come to that. Now, if you look at the picture over on the left, what do we see? Tons of butterflies, not only tons of butterflies, tons of monarch butterflies. So this is a beautiful food source. It's a beautiful little fuzzy flower. But as you can see on the little picture on the right, up close there, that is a type of native bumblebee that is a white bee and it's a solitary bee. And it also loves the fragrant mist flower. So this is something that you can plant out there, attract a lot of different pollinators, it's very easy to take care of, honestly, much like the cone flower. Once you get it in the ground and get it going, it's not going anywhere. It's going to continue to spread and you'll probably spend more time trying to keep it where you wanted it as opposed to taking over your entire area. But if it does, again, you have a beautiful landscape and you've got a beautiful nectar source for these pollinators. 
all asters. Now, asters include many, many, many different things, including mums. So all of your mums, all of your asters, these are going to be things that are going to produce nectar later in the year, and they produce a, an actual pollen source later in the year. Now, even though this says it blooms September through November, the world is topsy-turvy, and the ones out in front of my house bloomed in February. They bloomed again in April, and they're getting ready to bloom again, and we're not to September or November yet. So there's that, um, <laughs> but they're alive, they're thriving, they're doing well, and this again is one of these things where the plant itself makes a ton of different flowers. And if you have multiples of those plants, you can spread them out and use them as like kind of accents here and there. But the point is having multiples of them and not just one. One's okay, but five is better. And if you can do 10, that's even better. It just depends on your space. And the more of that one thing you have, the more native pollinators you're going to attract to these plants and be able to help pollinators as a whole. Okay, now then. We're going to stay here on this screen. I think this is actually, we're pretty close to the end of the slides, which I went way faster than I, I thought I would. Sorry about that. Um, gardening. So let's take a step back here real quick. Obviously, herbs are up on the screen, but let's switch over for a moment and let's talk about just gardening in general. Most of the time, people think honeybees, they think honeybees are going to pollinate our food. And you hear the adage, the fact that a third of everything out there is responsible from the pollination of honeybees. So a third of every bite of food you take, most of all of the nuts, a lot of the fruits, your avocados, your apples, you name it, they're gone if honeybees don't exist because honeybees solely focus on that specific thing. But not everything in your garden is that way. Yes, your honeybees are gonna go out there. They're gonna help pollinate your cucumbers. They're gonna help pollinate your squash. They're gonna help pollinate your peppers. But you know what they don't touch? Your tomatoes at all. A honeybee will never be anywhere near a tomato plant whatsoever. Now, a sweet bee and a bumblebee absolutely will. And if you're in your garden and you're out there with your tomato plants and you hear this little meep, meep noise, that is the sweet bee or the sweat bee actually inside the flower grabs a hold of the pollen and vibrates at that very high pitch, which busts the pollen kernels loose, and then it can actually gather them up and take them out. The bumblebee does the same thing, although not with as much finesse. It lands on it, grabs it, and it shakes it vigorously as it vibrates and bumbles, and it busts all those little pollen kernels loose, and then it can feed off of those, take them back to the nest. Most of the solitary bees, actually all of the bees, period, they use pollen as their protein source. Nectar is their carbohydrate. So nectar is the fuel that they need to fly. Same thing with your hummingbirds. Nectar is the fuel that allows them to fly. And man, are they a marvel of nature when it comes to being able to fly. They can fly fast. They can fly in any direction they want to, including reverse, which no other bird can do. They can hover. They're amazing. And they're fueled from the nectar, from the sugar, which is why people put up hummingbird feeders, which is just sugar syrup, sugar water. Now, back over to these other things. Your tomato plant. Anybody out there ever heard that old adage that if your tomatoes aren't blooming or not producing fruit, you should go out there and brush them or beat them with a broom. It's, that's the reason is because those flowers don't just let the pollen fall. They need some sort of rough vibration to make the pollen kernels come loose. So if you go out there and you flick the flowers, you can actually help pollinate your own tomatoes and get the tomatoes to grow. But if you actually cultivate space for these native pollinators, they will happily come and do a lot of that work for you. So something to look into if you do grow tomatoes and you're not growing tomatoes, you're just growing a tomato plant, you maybe you should look into, uh, you know, what other things are you doing in your garden to help propagate the native pollinators? Are you leaving bare patches of ground where some of the ground nesting ones can get down in their tunnel and reproduce when the plants die? Are you immediately taking them out of the garden? Or do you leave some of those tubular stems that are the hollow stems in the garden? Because again, that is a place where a lot of your native pollinators do the reproductive cycle. So a mason bee, for instance, mason bees don't actually dig holes. They propagate holes that are dug by other things, such as boars in a tree or the carpenter bee. Now the carpenter bee will come along and happily dig a hole into your wood siding or whatever. And then later, 
a mason bee will happily co-opt that hole. The leaf cutter bee is very similar to the mason bee, except one little difference, the, uh, the leaf cutter bee specifically likes roses, but likes to cut leaves, takes those leaves, rolls them up, and lines the inside of a tube with these leaves, and then all of them go out there and they gather pollen. They bring that pollen back, they make a little pollen nest, just a little patty in the center of that little nest that they've made, they lay an egg. That egg hatches and feeds off of that pollen, which again is the protein. That's what they need to actually develop and grow, go through metamorphosis and pupation and become an adult insect. Now, on your mason bees, for instance, if they don't have a tube, a hole in wood, they and the leafcutter bee will happily partake in tubes like hollow reeds. So a lot of the plants, sunflowers, for instance, when the sunflower dies, the inside of that plant ends up becoming hollow. If you leave some, you don't have to leave all of them, but if you leave some plants out there with their stems in the natural setting that they would be, it actually provides a nest site for a lot of these native pollinators. So again, if you don't see a lot of them in your area and you're constantly, as soon as the plant's done, you're taking it out, maybe dedicate little spaces here and there to where there's always some bare dirt in my garden in this area for this type of bee. And I always leave this little patch of things to stay all the way through the winter so that other solitary insects can do their reproductive cycle in those hollow reeds. Definitely something to keep in mind. Now, back over here. We don't have very much more on the screens and then we will go into questions. So, herbs. Herbs are amazing, okay? We love to grow them because we love to eat them, but guess what they do? If you let them grow, they bloom. And almost all of the herbs do prolific blooms. So one of, herb, one of the herbs that's not on here, oh, it is on there, I'm sorry, mint. Mint makes a long, fuzzy, multi-flowered tassel bloom at the tip of each of the little stems. Amazing pollinator plant. The variety of individual pollinators from flies to bees to wasps to just all kinds of different insects that come just to the mint plant. So I have lined my entire garden box with mint on the outside of it, both as a natural repellent to certain types of insects and for myself, because I really like mint tea, uh, but for the pollinators, I allow it to stay. I don't go through and call it all out. I don't cut it all down. I let it stay until it is gone to bloom and then quit blooming. And once it's done blooming, then I'll go through and I'll clean it up and I'll make it look pretty. But all of your herbs have this ability. And if you can leave some of them, even if you have like a giant garden box and you've got multiple rows of the same herb in every row, harvest what you need for yourself, but always leave at least a small section of each of those herbs to go through their entire life cycle and actually bloom because the bloom not only is going to give you seeds so that you can plant more the next season if you need to, but it's going to provide that very crucial food source for probably the widest variety of pollinators, especially in the insect world, that you possibly can. And it's something that a lot of us do all the time because we use our herbs to cook, we use them as natural repellents, we use them as natural aromatherapy, there's so many different things that can be done with the herbs, but we have to let them go through their entire life cycle so that we can also help benefit all of the pollinators out there that make our gardens possible, make everything beautiful, and help sustain life both in the, the, the world itself and on our plates so that we can live as well. So that is kind of the long and the short of it there. I think our next slide is basically just me. Yes. Okay. So my company is Wicked Bee. And that is my logo. And also, just as a little side note and uh, shameless plug, if you are interested in learning about honeybees specifically or you've ever wanted to be a beekeeper, that is a podcast called The Hive Jive. It is free. There's a new episode every single Monday. It's in its third year, fourth year. I'm kind of losing track at this point. But the whole first season and half of the second season walks an individual through the concept of how to get started in beekeeping from just the, I think I might want to, all the way up through tucking your colony in for its very first winter. It is actually way more entertaining than you might think. We've got a lot of people that listen to it that don't ever intend on being beekeepers, but they just like to listen to the banter between my co-host and myself. 
Um, so that is out there. That's always something that you guys can go and listen to. You can find it on literally any podcast platform. The bigger ones are going to be iHeart, Spotify, Apple, Stitcher, and Google. But literally anything you listen to music on, you can go through and type in the Hive Jive Beekeeping and it will come up. And that is where I will end the, uh, the presentation itself and we can open it up for questions. Okay, thank you very much, John. This is really fascinating. And it's fun to know that I have all of those plants in my yard, which is always fun. See, yeah. you're winning. <laughs> yeah, and so we do have some great questions and comments here from our group. One comes from Jim and he says that he has read that alpine flower meadows are pollinated by flies because bees do not live at that altitude. Is that true? It can be true, but like anything, not all the plants are any longer where they're supposed to be because we go through and we take them and we try to grow things because we think they're pretty and it doesn't necessarily mean that that is their natural habitat where they're supposed to be. But there are actually a lot of things out there. A lot of your cactus are actually pollinated by flies and not by bees. And certain ones of those have tailored their scent to be more along the lines of something that is going to be carnivorous, more like a meat smell, so that it does attract things like flies out there to it and wasps. But yes, that is, that is a true statement. Okay, well, that's, that's good to know. And about the anacua plant, if that's how you pronounce it. That's how I said it. <laughs> okay, does it have spiky branches? Uh, that I'm not sure, actually. I would, I would have to look into that. It's not, you mean spiky as in like our, our native mesquite where it's the thorn that hurts you? <laughs> I would guess that that was a question. If there's something sharp on it, I would, I would think so. Yeah, I'm not sure on that part, actually. Okay. And do you know if that's deer resistant? Most of these are supposed to be. I got these originally from a lady who worked for Barton Springs Nursery. She helped me go through and tailor the list of things that do really well in our area. So okay. all of those plants are things that can actually survive here in Central Texas, and yeah. all of them are bountiful nectar producers. Okay, um, and does the anacua, what is the growth rate of that? Is that a good replacement for, as someone said, the awful Bradford pear? I think anything is a good replacement for the Bradford pear. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah. I, do not, I do not actually know how quickly it grows. I would say it's probably a slower growing because okay. it doesn't necessarily get as big. It's going to take a little bit of time to get to its place. Okay. Okay. Uh, and Lawrence, uh, this, is, this is Tom oh, Kissinger. Can you put um, that on the, in the chat? Yes. I was just going to say the Anacua is a very slow grower, according okay. to the AM Forest Service. Okay. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, the um, a question about the, uh, you talked about the button bush. Mm -hmm. And when you look at that, you know, someone else thought about this as well as me. I first thought, when you said Dr. Seuss, I thought about the golden ball lead tree. And so do you consider, are you familiar with that? Do you consider- I am not, that? I am not familiar with that. Okay, look that up. It has those little fuzzy, beautiful balls. It's, I call it my Dr. Seuss tree. But it, it also is a great pollinator, so look that up. It it cover is covered, but it looks very similar to that button bush. I think there's is it a larger tree? Um, more so than the button bush. It may be twenty feet or so, fifteen. Okay. I think like I have actually seen those. I just didn't realize that was what they were called. There are several trees out here that do actually bloom and provide a lot of source and sustenance for other creatures. Um, I tried to keep this more smaller. Yeah in sure. size so that it could fit in a, a small yard if somebody didn't have a lot of space. Okay, and um, I have a, a, a comment about the Greg's mist flower that right now is just covered with, with, with the butterflies. And, and this is a question that comes up, someone sent this in that comes up a lot. Um, it is tough to propagate and grow native milkweed. That would be our choice, of course. Right. And so we can often purchase tropical milkweed uh -huh. and then uh, which which is great for that whole reproductive cycle for the monarchs but we are told to cut them back in October um, is that because of their journey south is that something that you know about or would recommend doing 
See, I'm not necessarily sure on that. Um, I don't know if the point of cutting it back is for the plant or if it's for the butterfly itself. And, supposedly for the butterfly so that it right. wouldn't wanna... So they don't, don't want to stop and lay eggs on that. And absolutely. They want to yeah. keep on going. So in that case, then yes, you would want to make sure that you would cut that back. Because again, if you encourage them to try to do the reproductive cycle towards the end of the year, mm -hmm. it's never going to necessarily survive winter. You know, the caterpillar doesn't go into a hibernative state like a lot of the other insects do. It hatches and feasts until it is large enough that it can pupate, turns into the butterfly and goes on its journey. So that would make sense from that perspective. Okay. Um, someone else was giving a shout out to their Abelia grandiflora that attracts bees, hummers and giant swallowtail. And they're just really thrilled with that bush. And also someone who um, has a lot of mammoth sunflowers. And yeah. so they're going to be sure that they make tubes for them and, and take advantage of what you just talked about there. Yeah, you can, you can actually use, you can go through and collect varying different sizes of the plants that do have the hollow tubes mm -hmm. and make your own native bee house for mason bees and other bees by having a variety of different sizes rolling them into a bundle and then just tying it and hanging it from somewhere and they will come up in there and they'll use mud and they'll coat the back of it with mud they'll make one of those little pollen nests then they'll make another wall of mud and another pollen nest and another wall of mud and another pollen nest and then in the weird twists of nature the boys hatch first and they're the last ones laid and they come out and then the females hatch last and they come out and the boys are then sexually mature and ready to mate with the females that sounds like fun. How fun that is. You've observed a lot of really cool things, it sounds like. Yes. That is, that is fabulous. You were, you were men mentioning herbs and the mint family. Um, something we've sold before at our plant sale, the Peter's Purple Bee Balm. Um, yep. It is also called horse mint. Yep. Do, you, do you consider that in the mint family? So yes and no. It, it's one of those things that like a tomato is in the same family as nightshade, but it doesn't kill you. Um, they're, they're related, but it is not mint. Like when we talk about mint as an herb, I don't see horse mint as the herb. I see horse mint as a wildflower that is out there for the native pollinators. And horse mint actually is a wonderful nectar source. That is one of our primary nectar flows here for honeybees is horse mint at that time of year. Horse mint, Indian blanket, and then mesquite, but only if nothing else is blooming. If the mesquite goes into bloom, which is usually after a long, hot, dry period with no rain, it goes into bloom, and usually other things aren't blooming because of the long, hot, dry period, bees will flock to it, and it is a bountiful nectar producer. Uh, but yeah, horse mint is one of my favorite things. If you taste honey with horse mint in it, it gives you a citrusy zing at the very last note, and wow. that's one of the ways you can indicate that it came from that. Um, it also paints a white mohawk on the stripe on the head of the bees because the way the flower is, it's a double petal flower. The pollen is on the top petal and the nectar's down. So they've got to crawl between the two and the pollen coats the back of the bee. Wow. So they'll actually come back to their nest with these white mohawks. And that's how you know they've been on horse mint. Oh, how interesting. How cool is that? Okay. Um, and, and then again, someone asked a question about what month should we cut back? And I'm assuming they were talking about the, um, the tropical milkweed. That would be sometime in October. Yeah, I mean, so what I would, so this was something that I haven't actually looked a lot into, but what you would want to do is you're going to have to go through the, what the gestation period of a caterpillar all the way through the pupation cycle to a butterfly, what it is. And if you're, if you're worried about that and you're worried about them laying eggs on those plants that are blooming later in the year, you want to cut those back soon enough that if somebody did lay an egg on it, they had time to make it through that cycle. If they don't, go through and remove them at that point. Absolutely. Okay. Well, anything else you'd like to add to that, John? Um, I mean, I don't know. My brain is always just like swimming with random factoids and information. So I could, no. I could go on many tangents. <laughs> no, that, is, that is fascinating. It is, it is so fun to see all of these pollinators out in the yard. And um, I, I have a plethora of bumblebees out there too. And it's so fun when the little children who are here say to themselves, 
if I leave them alone, they'll leave me alone. And they, they learn to not be so afraid and run from those pollinators, but that yeah. realize they're part of nature. Which most is of the time, regardless the species of bee, most of the time, they're not gonna bother you at all if they are foraging. If they're actively out there foraging, they don't care about you. You're inconsequential. You are, you are a moving tree that just all of a sudden was in their way. So one may buzz up by you, that's because you weren't there whenever they came in and they're trying to go out the same way they were and they may stop and they may even go around you and be like, what is this thing? Memorizing the space and the area and the dimension and then go on their way so that they can make a return trip. Mm -hmm. But they usually will not harm you. It's only when you disturb their nest site that they will actually become defensive. And for the most part, most of those native bees, they won't sting anybody. I mean, you have to actually like smack them or hurt them or do an act of aggression towards them to get them to come back after you. Um, one other little fun tidbit, and it's not as easy to tell in certain species, but male bees do not have a stinger. So if it's a male, it can't sting you if it wants to. Yeah, I've been told that about ground wasps and I'm counting on that, <laughs> which are pretty dangerous looking. So thank you so much. I, I do want to say to everyone, we have recorded this session. And so give us a few days and we will have this cleaned up and posted on our Williamson County Master Gardeners website. So if you want to go back and see the names of those plants again that you that you didn't write down you know, quickly enough, we will, you, you can see this again and that'll be a great thing for you to do. So we appreciate you so much, John, very, very much. Um, Master Gardeners and everyone else who's here, join us in person in September, uh, the second Monday of September. We're so excited to actually meet together. We will actually have it on Zoom as well for those of you who'd rather not get out in the evening, but we uh, will meet in person next month and uh, check out our website for all the activities volunteer information and hands on the garden that will be coming up the fourth saturday of august so join us for all of that and uh, we are glad to see you here and see you in in the garden and uh, see you uh, from time to time as, as you visit with us and learn together. So thank you, John. And um, everyone is saying, thank you, John. This is great, 100% um, useful. When someone plans their new garden, they were really appreciative of all of that. And so a lot of thank you scrolling through. So thank you very much, John. Wonderful, we appreciate it. Goodbye, every goodbye thank everyone. You. Thank you. Goodbye, everyone, and we'll see you next month. Okay, if not before. Okay, bye.